Good morning. Happy Palm Sunday. We just want to thank you for being here, all of our online family. Thank you for joining us on a beautiful Sunday. If you don't know what Palm Sunday is, today is the day that the Lord Jesus so lowly came and entered the city on a donkey. And if you don't know this, this King of Kings went so low, he rode on a donkey, knowing that one day he will return on a white horse. His name is Faithful and True, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, the Great I Am. So go ahead and lift up your voice and just begin to let thanksgiving arise. Thank you, Jesus, for coming so low, but thank you, Jesus, that you are coming. You will come on a white horse to save, deliver, and set free the lost. And you're coming for a bride, Jesus. So we ask that you purify us today, Jesus. Let us see you rightly today as we lift you up and see you as King of Kings, Lord of Lords, the great I am. Hosanna in the highest, Jesus. We lift you high this morning, Jesus. We will see you rightly. We will give you the praise, honor, and glory that you deserve. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.
Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here this morning. Jesus, you're so beautiful. Come on, church, for a moment. Just tell him you love him. He loves to hear the affection from his children. We love you, Lord. Come on, come on, come on. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Jesus. We love you, Lord. Beautiful. There's no one like you. We love you. Beautiful Jesus. Just another moment. Come on, come on. Just another moment. We love you, Lord. You're high and lifted up. We love you. We love you. Precious one. Precious one. Precious one. So baptize us today, Jesus. We thank you, Father, for the blood of Jesus. We thank you, Father, for the blood of Jesus that covers us, God, that covers our sins, that covers us. You're so good to us, Jesus. Just thank him for a moment. When you thank the Lord, things begin to happen. Just thank him for a moment. You didn't leave us as an orphan, Jesus, but you came, God. You came for us, and you're so good, Jesus. We worship you this morning, Jesus. Holy Spirit, make Jesus real to us today, God. Make Jesus real, God. Set the captive free today. We love you, Jesus. Beautiful Lamb, beautiful Jesus, the suffering one who came and died, who overcame death. You're so beautiful, Jesus. You're so beautiful, Lord. You're so beautiful, Lord. You're so beautiful, Jesus. We could stare at your face forever and still say you're so beautiful, Jesus. Mighty one, mighty one. Oh, Holy Spirit, have your way today in Jesus' name. Have your way. Jesus, yeah, even for the children this morning, have your way in Jesus' name, Lord. We worship you, King of kings and Lord of lords. Thank you, Jesus. I just give him a shout or something costly this morning. what the Lord has done. His mercies are new every day. We thank you for that, Jesus. We love you. We love you so much, God. It's our joy to come in your presence, Lord. There's nothing like it. We magnify you this morning. We say, come, Lord Jesus, come. Come. We worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Let our worship team know you love them. Love you. Best worship team ever. Court, it's nice to see you this morning. Oh, I'm going to invite Amy Pazinski. Let Amy know that you love her. King is here, amen. 
my spirit woke up this morning saying Hosanna. Hosanna. Hosanna means praise. It's exuberant praise because he's worthy. And it's time to give to our king. Amen. Are you excited to give to our king today? I had a different scripture, but as I walked up the steps, I just heard the Lord say, John 3, 16, that verse we know, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And this is Holy Week, right? And our king is in the room. And it is our joy to bring him what he's given to us. It is our joy because God gave his best. He gave his best on that cross for us. So he's worthy of everything. And I don't feel like I have to, I don't feel like I have to say much today because he's worthy because of what he gave for us. And we don't have to give because the Lord needs our, our finances, right? He doesn't need them, but he wants our hearts. He really wants our hearts. And I say this every time I come up here, but I believe that the Lord is speaking to us as a church, that we are going to be the most generous church. We are going to be the ones that come every Sunday with our offering prepared, with our tithes prepared. And I do believe today that there's some of you that the Holy Spirit is going to speak to to give something sacrificial this morning because he sacrificed everything in the giving of his son. And so Jesus, let's just pray. Jesus, we thank you for the privilege to be in this room today, Lord, to worship you, to give you praise, to give you our highest praise, our highest praise. It is our joy to come and give you praise, Lord. And it is also our joy to bring our tithes and our offerings into your hands today, Jesus, out of response for your great love for us. So Jesus, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you speak to every heart, mine included, Lord. What could we bring you today? What could we bring our King who is worthy of everything? What could we bring you? What do you want from us today, Jesus? We invite you to speak, Holy Spirit, and we won't hesitate. We will give freely into your hands this morning. So bless this seed, multiply it, Jesus. Use it to further your kingdom. Use it for your glory, Jesus, that every knee would bow and every tongue would confess that you are Lord. We love you, Jesus, and it is our joy to give into your hands today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So if you're in the room, you can give to the number on your screen. If you're watching and your family watching online today and Jesus' image has blessed you, we invite you to give to the Lord today as well. If you need an offering envelope and you're in the rooms, just lift your hands really high and our ushers will come and bring you an envelope. Let's give joyfully and cheerfully to our King today. Amen. Amen. And we will be right back in just a moment.
Good morning. The Lord is good. Give Jesus praise. Come on. Come on, let's give the Lord praise. Lord, we love you. And we worship you and adore you. Let's just, just stay in this posture of prayer. Holy Spirit, you're the one. You're the one who paints the face of Jesus before the eyes of our heart. And we ask this morning that your word would be our food, that our hearts would open, that you'd cut us deep. We trust you, Lord. Your word is life. Your words are spirit and life. And so we open our hearts. I plead the blood today over this preaching of your precious word. And Holy Spirit, carry every word. Let not one fall to the ground. Let every word land and bear fruit in our hearts that Jesus would be so lifted and loved in us, in our families, and in the nations. In Jesus' name, amen. Now seal it with praise. Come on, give the Lord praise. Thank you, Jesus. Good morning. I wanted to, I want to shout with you. I'm just not allowed yet. <laughs> so I'm just kind of a backseat driver. <laughs> um, how are you? You doing well? Um, it's good to be back. And uh, it's not fun not talking for four months. But um, I feel like I have something to say today. Um, before we go any further, we have some dear friends with us. They're probably not too happy I'm doing this, but it's just the way we roll. Uh, Jeremy and Katie Riddle are here this morning, and I just want us to let them know that we love them. Love you both so much. And, uh, oh. It's, it means so much when people take the time to fly across the nation. How many of you know flying is a little, a little more stressful than it used to be? And uh, they're here with us, and it's going to be a phenomenal time together. I love you both so much. So much honor and respect um, for them and their family. Um, I don't know if you guys know this, but Jeremy was really pivotal in God birthing uh, our worship community. Um, way back at the at St. Andrews, um, that little Presbyterian church, Jeremy did a show of hands. How many of you feel like you're called to worship? And we were under the assumption that nobody, like we had like three worshipers. Um, but then like nine hands went up. I was like, where have y'all been hiding? All we had was like a cajon that would be broken. I think we bought four because uh, Kyle would hit them so hard, he'd shatter them. They're not cheap. They're like 450 bucks. I said, you break the next one, you're paying for it. Hit it, that thing softer. <laughs> we had that. We had a guitar. We had a keyboard. And I think that was probably it. Yeah. So Jared did a show of hands and called them forward, laid hands on them. And it was really the birthing of uh, what the Lord is doing among a true uh, Levitical company. So love you guys so much. And I feel like they're here at another pivotal time. Uh, just feel prophetically that, um, that God sent them on the perfect, perfect week. Amen? Okay. You know I'm not an announcement guy, but this isn't like regular church announcements. Not a fish fry. Um, this is actually part of our mission, what I'm about to share. Um, we're going to launch Jesus Image Missions today. And it starts today. Um, so listen, if you are in, and here's the vision behind it, it's, it's obviously the great commission that's fueled by first love, which is the great commandment. That's the only way in, for this thing to actually be a commission. It should actually be called Jesus Image Commissions, but that'd be confusing. None of us want to go on a mission. We all want to go on a commission, which is with the Lord. And the great commandment is what fuels us and prepares us to walk with him in the nations. You don't want to go alone. Trust me, I've tried it. It's much better to go with Jesus. And 
it's vital that we are on the ground when people are suffering and when people need the gospel, when they need the love of God. So when a hurricane hits, I want this church to be on the ground, beaming and shining, just like Jesus. Amen? If a tornado hits, we're going to be on the ground. Uh, if there's trouble in the nations, we sent a team to, uh, to, the, to the border of Ukraine just a few weeks ago. Uh, Ryan actually led the team. Uh, Esther, who all went? Esther Blake. Colleen, they ministered to hundreds of refugees there on the, on the Polish-Ukrainian border. It changed their lives, and, and I could sense the pleasure of the Lord on it. And so for all of you evangelists, all of you uh, who, <laughs> if you don't know what you are, you want to be part of the Lord's destiny and plan for the ages, you need to share the gospel. It's more important that we join God's great plan than try to get him to join what we're crafting up. There is an agenda for the ages and the gospel flooding the earth is pivotal. I want us to be part of that. Amen? So all of you who've been waiting, you've been, felt like a, you've been feeling like a corralled lion, send me out. Text that number and we're going to begin flooding the nations and this city and our state and this nation with the love of Jesus. Amen? All right. Good Friday is coming. It's, it's going to be amazing. And um, super excited about that. We're going to take communion together, sing of the wonderful cross of Jesus, and, uh, and, and, and really watch the Lord move powerfully. Obviously, Sunday morning is, is Resurrection Sunday. So today is kind of the start of Holy Week. Yeah, there's the info on Easter Sunday. Make sure you're here. Get here early. And uh, that's that. How'd I do? Did I do good? Okay. You have no idea how hard that is for me. I want you to take your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 2. I want you to mark I'll just keep verses 1 and 2 there before your eyes. And before I start, I want to give a, I'm sitting because it actually keeps me from pushing my voice. Court, you probably didn't know that. This musical theory, you didn't know that. Um, part of the challenge of, uh, I think I'm good for now, Joel. Part of the challenge of leading or pastoring, serving God's people today, leadership on any level is walking the tightrope between calling out sin and not missing the plank in your own eye and allowing the Lord to minister through you with grace and truth which only comes through the person of Jesus. But I feel like to, to not address um, certain things would just cause them to fester and grow. And there are certain giants that need their head cut off. And when the Lord starts to decapitate giants through your life, uh, you will, you're signing up to be misunderstood, which is part of the cross. Misunderstanding is possibly one of the most painful things you, you can walk through when your intentions are pure and people you love don't see it that way. That's a very difficult journey. Uh, you sign up for that when you become a believer. The celebrity thing is being pulverized now by the Lord not principalities, by the Lord. Building church for the sake of people alone is being pulverized by the Lord. The only way to really reach people is to get Jesus into the room yes. and keep him. 
uh, Martha brought him in, but only Mary kept him. And interestingly enough, when Jesus has his first conversation to raise Lazarus from the dead, in some ways it turns into a theological conversation with Martha. She's first to meet him. And she wants to talk about the resurrection. Her heart seemed to be a bit more topical. Uh, but she certainly understood what it meant to volunteer in church. There's an old saying, when Jesus wants your love, don't bring him a sandwich. Just love him. But for the resurrection power to flow, Jesus kind of changes the, uh, he turns the page. He has this convo with Martha, and they discuss the resurrection to come, and then he says, where's Mary? In other words, I need to get this man out of the grave. Find me somebody who loves me. So, all of these things, these idols, I love the, uh, I loved the choir piece last Sunday night, if you didn't watch it, it had this verse, cast down every idol, we're desperate for revival. We throw our crowns in the dust. And I, I think that part of the reason that there's been such a mixture and a diluting of who and what the church should be is because in many cases we've removed the slug, as my friend Dave Papavisi says, the slug in the shell that we call the gospel, and that slug would be the crucified life. Um, I'm sure there are people here from multiple backgrounds. I'm not going to sit the whole time. I can't, I can't I'll do it. <laughs> I did good for six minutes. Um, I'm sure many of you are here from multiple ba backgrounds. Many of you come from what I maybe, I guess you would call revival culture, whatever that means. I'm not sure that I, we even know anymore. But I've said this many times to our team. We just came off a prayer retreat for three days. It was wonderful. The Lord moved so powerfully the last night. But the emblem, the centerpiece of our faith, is not a portal. or a feather. I've seen them. So don't misunderstand what I'm saying. The crux of our faith is not activation. Though I believe in activation. And what I need you to do today is sit maturely and actually hear what I'm saying don't, don't, on my behalf, throw the baby out with the bathwater. The crux of our faith is not mobilizing. Here's another one that has to die. This idol of influence. Influence has been deified in certain circles. So we raise up people who can influence Gen Z, for instance, but not influence the throne room. Or move the heart of the Father, but we can move people on social media. Unto what? What are we moving them toward and to? Attendance? Budget? I don't know. But remember this, if it's not about Jesus, listen to me clearly, if you're gonna get one thing this morning, if it's not about Jesus, it must be about something else. Has to be. By default, if it's not about him, it must be about something else. And the temptation to include him in the something else is proof we don't see him rightly. Because he who is all cannot be part of. 
Does that make sense? I, I didn't, I, I didn't, I wasn't in advanced math, but that one I understand. If he's all, he cannot be part of. Make sense? So that being the case, he doesn't need any help from us to make him famous. He's really famous already. The date bears witness to his life. He's famous. Right? He has Christmas. He's doing fine. So he doesn't need our compromise in an attempt to supposedly make him famous. What he wants is us. Yieldedness is much more holy to him than fleshly ambition in his name. I swear I love you. I'm not, I'm not trying to slap you around. I, but I'm, I'm going to see you at the throne one day and give an account. And it's a very sobering thought to me. So I want to read Paul's words here. And I want you to listen to the language. We are entering Holy Week, and one of the things I like to do over these next few days is meditate on the passion. And to meditate on the scriptures, it's the combination of adoration and prayer mingled with the beautiful, uh, holy reading of scripture. Until the eyes of your heart open, until it becomes yours. The prophet said in the Old Covenant, I will wait and see what the Lord has to say. And Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart. They will see the Lord. It's almost a forgotten holy art form in the church to meditate on the scriptures in an atmosphere of prayer and worship. I want you to, with the eyes of your heart, receive Paul's words here because they are loaded and life-changing. Verse 1, 1 Corinthians 2. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined, I want you to underline that, circle it, and highlight it with your Christian bookstore utensil there. I determined. Another word there is purposed. The Amplified says, made the decision. So the will is involved here. I purposed, I have determined. Have you ever met a determined person? For those of you who haven't, let me, help you. Let me say that another way. Have you ever argued with your spouse? Okay. You have discovered the power of determination. One is right and the other is wrong. Typically, they're wrong, right? Okay. That's what determination looks like. I have determined, listen to the language, not to know anything. Anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. This is coming from a man who memorized the Torah. Trained by Gamaliel, an amazing, Paul in and of himself, an amazing philosopher, a very cultured man, a Pharisee, understood the feasts of Israel, as I said, memorized the text. And where did all of that lead him? To kill the beloved of God. Paul says here, I don't just know Jesus. I have determined to know nothing but Jesus. That means he has allowed the Holy Spirit to take the scalpel of addition to his life and heart. Until all that is left is this. I have nothing to say to you but Christ and him crucified. 
We want the Lord to add to us, and he does, but oftentimes the Lord is reducing until we're left with one thing. Some of you are in that season now. The Lord is just reducing, 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 reducing until you're left with a pearl. Because he's all. But Paul doesn't say, I, I preach Jesus to you alone. He says, I, I purpose to know nothing among you but Christ and him crucified. That means that a Jesus who has not been crucified is New Age philosophy. And a cross with no Jesus is dead religion. It's got to be both. I've heard people say, you, you, I preach the cross, I preach the cross, and I don't hear the name of Jesus. I say, you're missing the point. You're creating culture that's based on what not to do, and it doesn't work. Right. Try it. Try getting free by trying not to be in sin. It doesn't work. You get free by rejecting the sin and turning to Jesus. That's biblical repentance. So in the early church, when uh, uh, they had a vision of the Lord, one of the fathers would see the Lord, or somebody in the church, in the, you know, the patristic era of the church, would see the Lord, the first question they would ask is, did he have holes? Did you see the wounds? No, it wasn't him. Listen clearly. In other words, if he's not crucified, we're not interested. We don't know that one. We don't recognize him. That's an angel of light. The cross, listen, the, the crucified Christ, the cross, is not so much something he did, though it is, it's who he is. It's got to go deeper than this mere emergency ascension on a tree to set you free. Because if it's not, listen carefully, if he did something that he is not internally, he is not true. I'm going to say that again. If he does stuff that he is not on the inside... He's not completely true. Jesus only does what he really is. Is this making sense? Too much on a Sunday morning? All right. I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm not allowed to preach. I can only teach. Doctor's orders. The crucified life is not a chapter in the life and nature of Jesus. Now, some of you from a kingdom background, which too has been blurred, by the way, because the way to further the kingdom is not to talk about kingdom topics. The way to further the kingdom is to preach the king and live in yieldedness to the king. And then he takes domain. But the way to spread the kingdom is not by starting all these conversations about, oh, I don't know how free I can be because we're live, but like you don't, you don't further the kingdom by spending your whole life talking about this ethereal kingdom and never mentioning Jesus. That's how you get swirly and wonky and it, it ruins songwriting. It destroys songwriting. It crushes the heart of priestly ministry because it leaves him out of it. And we start writing songs about how we're doing. And God goes, I know how you're doing. I'm well aware of how you're doing. Sing to me. Another thing that's being revealed now under the light of God is there's a big difference between a professing Christian artist and a worship leader. A big difference. Because the Christian world is a massive genre, and even unbelievers are figuring that out. 
I won't go any further. And, and, and the missing, the, the missing hub in the wheel is Christ crucified. There's a woman, uh, Madame Guyon, she said this, the cross gives me God, and then I discovered God gives me a cross. And so what we've done is we've said, the cross is part of the journey. <laughs> and, and, and this is the only time you carry it, when you come down to the altar and repeat a prayer. So you run down, you repeat the prayer, you get through that cross thing, and then you just shoot through into resurrected life, and now you can do whatever you want to do. In the name of Jesus, of course, who still has wounds, which is proof the cross matters today. Why do you think when he ascended and lifted his hands in Acts chapter 1 and blessed the company of God, the newborn church, why did he do that? He was reminding them, I am flying and I am glorified. Yes, amen. But don't forget, there are holes in my body. Never forget the tree. Does this make sense to you? What I want to submit to you today is that the cross is not a one-stop shop. But the wooden cross is the very uniform of, belie of the believer that qualifies you to even join the procession of the Christ our King who is walking ahead of us. He said, if any man desire to come after me, that's the Christian life, by the way. We, we've called that like next level intense Christianity. But Jesus is calling it in that context. This is step one. You, you can't even join this thing that I have birthed called the church if you don't first deny yourself and take up your cross. So if you were to picture this massive parade that we would call the agenda of God that is set on glorifying King Jesus. The father is obsessed with his son and the son is such a yielded son that one day everything will be under his feet and out of his yieldedness, imagine this, he'll give it back to the father. That used to bother me a lot. Like why would you go through all that and just give it away? Because that's what yielded sons do. It's his nature. He's always been the one who gives his life away. Remember, the scripture says Jesus was crucified before the foundations of the world. Where? In the heart of God. It's who, he, therefore, that's who he is. Are you getting it? So Christ Jesus out front carrying the tree. He says to his disciples, if any man desire to come after me, if you want to follow me, you have to wear what I'm wearing, wood. I know this is heavy, but this is Christianity. And I, and, and, and I think that's part of what I want to push back against is the other stuff is not our faith. It might sound good, but it's not, it is not the hub in the wheel. The centerpiece of our faith is this wounded one nailed to a tree. Risen? Of course risen. Of course he's risen. But you don't get to be raised unless you die. And so to follow Jesus, you say no to Michael. I have to say no, Michael. Yes, Jesus. Daily. That's the whole pulse of the cross. The entirety of the pulse of the cross is no, Michael. Yes, Jesus. No, Michael. Yes, Jesus. You say, but all, all that will be left at the end will be Jesus. That's the point. It's the point of this whole thing. In a Christian wedding, the wife loses her name and gains the name of the husband. Paul compared the Christian wedding experience, the marriage experience, to the great mystery of Jesus and his bride. The whole point is to lose you and gain him. 
And if what I'm saying, it sounds a little foreign, it's not the gospel's fault, it's culture's fault in the house of God. Okay. So take your Bibles to Luke 24. Is this all right? Luke 24, 13, we call this the road to Emmaus account. Before we read it, let me just, I have to build this foundation in your heart. You have the apostle who writes half of the New Testament, over half, saying this, I purpose to know nothing among you but Christ and him crucified. He's writing that to the Corinthian church who is doused with spiritual gifts. That is proof that if you walk in the crucified life, you will have no lack of spiritual activity, the activity of the Spirit. But to hear those words from a man like Paul, who could have talked about so much because he had so much in him, is very telling. Like we actually, the set list comes my way every service from the worship team because I'm invested in their personal lives and lives, but also, I want to know that we are singing Bible. Because it matters. To us, they're just a song, but there's, listen, don't, don't miss this, there is something glorious that's much deeper than just choosing a song. Jesus said if we touch anything, he would do it. Songs are prayers to heavenly melodies. That's what they should be. Choosing the right song in the right moment is to get the entire room to touch one thing. And God starts moving. Does that make sense? And God is not afraid of repetitious songs. Worthy is the Lamb is on repeat in the throne room. Does that make sense to you? So you want to have this without being controlling in your own heart. You want to begin, listen... As God's people, begin stewarding what you're listening to. Change the game. Change the taste buds. Push back on this Leviathan. If, and don't, don't choose with your eyes. Don't choose because it's a, it's a good, savvy video. Close your eyes and choose based on the moisture it brings to your heart. Is there rain on it? Is the Lord carrying it? Is the Holy Spirit endorsing it? Is it about Jesus? Is it Christ exalting? If not, if not, look, you are powerful people who God has given a free will to. Push back, determine what the church will listen to and receive. Is this making sense? Okay. Luke 24. Verse 13. Now behold, two of them were traveling the same day to a village called Emmaus. And the word Emmaus means, it can mean a hot spring or place of salvation. So if you bring the two together, you could say hot spring of salvation. We are, say this out loud. I am on the road to Emmaus. We all are. We're all continually, daily, seeing our salvation worked out. Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem, not too far, like Lake Mary to Longwood. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Listen to me. He hears your conversations. And our conversations can draw him close or reject him. 
Choose wisely. Choose wisely. Choose who you spend your time with and what you talk about. Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained, they were blinded, so that they did not know him. And he said to them, What kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Okay. How many of you believe that Jesus asked that question because he didn't know the answer? <laughs> no. Okay. This is a great tip. When the Lord asks you a question, it's never because he doesn't know. It's because he wants you to know. And here we see his sense of humor. I love this about him, actually. Verse 18. Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only... <laughs> Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? Have you not known the things which happened here these days? Okay. Side note. <laughs> Without the indwelling of the Spirit, humanity actually has the audacity to ask Jesus if he knows a man named Jesus. That's basically what they're doing. Like, where have you been? There was a guy named Jesus. Is, they're telling this to Jesus. There was a guy named Jesus who died on a cross. And, uh, you'll see in a moment. But that's how dumb we are outside the presence. The presence of Jesus, the presence of the Spirit, is not a side issue. You would be shocked. Maybe some of you are not so shocked now. At how stupid humanity can be outside the presence of the Lord. Look at Adam and Eve. That caused a, caused a big problem. Let's keep reading. Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there these days? And he said to them, what things? <laughs> Don't you love him? I love everything about him. I, I love that he messes with us like that. I just think it's beautiful. So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth. They're saying this to Jesus of Nazareth. <laughs> who was a prophet. Mighty indeed. Was, is that true or not? Yes. Yeah, it's true. And word before God and people. Is that true? Was he powerful in word? Yes. Yeah, great preacher, great prophet, for sure. Verse 20, and how the chief priests and rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Hmm. And certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. I'm breaking a church growth rule here by reading you more than six scriptures in a row. And when they did not find his body, they came saying that they who had also seen a vision of angels said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Oh, here it comes. And then he said to them, oh, foolish ones. In other words, you're a fool. That's what it says. <laughs> And slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken. Let me stop there. What they said to him wasn't untrue. It was just incomplete. There's this Jesus, a mighty prophet. And mighty in word. And he's like, yeah, true, but you're missing the point to see Jesus rightly you have to see him more fully the Shulamite said rightly do they love you there is a right way to walk in intimacy with Jesus 
Does this make sense to you? An incomplete teaching of Christ Jesus, where we cherry pick his nature and leave out the crux of the issue, is to preach a different Jesus. So now I want you to see how Jesus responds, don't miss this, and where he starts. This is vital. Because if it's his starting point, it must be the church's starting point. Would you say amen to that? Do you believe that? Okay. O foolish ones, verse 25, and slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and enter into his glory? Let's look at verse 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Are you getting this? They are dead and blind, walking. They can't even recognize the risen Christ before them, walking with them. Jesus puts up with their blindness and messes with them a little. Oh, tell me a little more. It's only three days out. This is fresh on his heart. But he lets him keep going. Oh, really? There's a prophet named Jesus. Yeah, oh yeah. And he's mighty in word. Hmm, hmm, tell me more. What things? What's going on over there? Where, where have you been, Jesus? Finally, he has, in his mercy, enough. He's had enough with their blindness. And he goes, okay, let's open their eyes. Which is one of the great privileges of the Christian life, to have your eyes open. Okay, how does he do it? Look back down at your Bible. He starts in the scriptures. This may not sound as sexy or as alluring, but it's his way. So if you were going to have a Bible study with Jesus and you were blind, this is how we do it. He took them to Old Testament text and showed them who he is and Moses and all the prophets. One of the great tragedies that swept the church over the last 12 years was this teaching that all Old Testament text is mere law, that even the gospels are law, that words in red are law, because we have new life in Christ, and Paul wrote this, and this is our inheritance. They didn't even know they were reading something called the Old Testament at that time, just called the scriptures. If the resurrected God-man found it necessary to show who he is in the scriptures, we should do the same. But what's his starting point in the scriptures? Look back down. You've got to catch this. It's in verse 25. O foolish ones, slow of heart to believe in all the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered? That's the cross. And entered into his glory. What's he saying? The starting point is Jesus Christ crucified and risen. Not part of the story. He's saying you start here and the entire Bible begins to make sense. The cross is not a piece of this massive story. But Christ crucified is the story. I, I, I don't mean, I, I don't want to, I'm not trying to be like, annoying <laughs> but the, 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 the narrative of the scriptures is not there's a big lion coming I don't know maybe you have a lion on your arm that's fine <laughs> I don't know but the lion <laughs> Jesus is mentioned as lion a couple times the narrative of the scriptures is a lamb is coming to bleed 
What the world needs are lamb-like lovers of Jesus. Listen, if you want God to roar like a lion through you, become like a lamb. If you miss this lamb likeness, you begin to self-exalt and glory in flesh and glory in your own ability. But there's something beautiful about those who come to die daily. And this has been, can I have 10 extra minutes this morning? Oh, eight of you said yes. Okay. This will do you much better than a visitor's bag or a little lunchbox, whatever you get today. I don't know. But this will sustain you at the throne. This is the gospel. In Genesis 3.15, don't turn there. The Lord is the first one to preach the gospel. Adam and Eve sin. And the Lord announces to them, there's a man coming. He tells the serpent, I should say, there's a man coming. Don't you love the fact the first gospel preacher was the Lord himself? That, that word is called, that, that passage, the fathers of the church called the proto first, where we get prototype, evangelion, the, the first gospel, the first preaching of the gospel. So we get the word evangelist. The first evangelism, the first declaration, right there in Genesis 3.15. And the Lord says, a seed will come. There will be enmity between your seed and her seed. In other words, a man will come out of the woman, and he will crush your head. Listen to how the head is crushed. Through the bruising of a heel. That's the wisdom of our God. That he brings life through death. That he brings glory in weakness. In my weakness, he's made, you got it. That's all right there. One will crush through his bruising. Death, listen, death will die through his death. That's wisdom. It's so lowly. See, Jesus took the trap door of humility and lowliness to destroy the one who always exalted himself. Is this, is this making sense? Okay. So right now, church, listen. Right now, God, Satan's up to stuff, no doubt. Just open your eyes. But on the other hand, God is swinging his axe at the root. This is a bridal paradigm. As the age of, comes to an end, as Jesus' return approaches, there'll be a great revealing between Babylon and the bride that will intensify and there'll be a great revealing between wheat and tares. It will ultimately be revealed at his coming, according to the Lord's word, where the angels will separate. But I believe we're seeing it now, where you're almost starting to see this great separation take place. Okay? So the Lord is swinging his axe. The winning fan is, is being used. Chaff and wheat are being separated. And by the way, the baptism of fire is not meant for excitement in John's gospel or any, anything that John the Baptist talks about. The baptism of, he said, he will baptize in the Holy Spirit and fire. The Spirit is the blessing. The fire is judgment and purification. That's the whole point of a winnowing fan. It's not so you can jump and like freak out. Sometimes there's time for that. There's room for that. But that's not the purpose. The purpose is bridal. It's a wheat and tares narrative. It's a... It's a purification, this purging. So when God starts swinging the axe at the root, listen to me, at the root, the only way you survive is if you go lower than the root. You don't want your head cut off when God is swinging an axe. This isn't the time to judge. This is a time, listen, to be sober and hide your heart. As the scripture says, 
A wise man foreseeth danger and hideth himself. And hideth there means prayer. Get lower than the roots right now because even the roots are being revealed. If you go low at the foot of the cross, the devil will have no pedestal to throw you off of. So Psalm 22 says, I am but a worm. Jesus said that, I am but a worm. That's as low as you can go. And therefore he could say, he has no room in me. He has no place in me. I'm coming down. Getting excited. <laughs> this stuff gets me going. Are you all awake or are you bored? Okay, I just... I just want to make sure you're, you're, I need to make sure you're, you're chewing on it. We don't need any throwing up. <laughs> okay, so. Jesus multiplies bread and fish. It's a wonderful thing. Amen, right? If you're hungry... He, he, he healed the sick for three days. What a loving Savior. And after three days, <laughs> the disciples are like, hey, we don't have any food. If you read the text properly, the narrative the right way, he's out there three days. It's a long healing service. He multiplies bread and fish twice. And they want to make him king. Because we all want a king who gives us stuff. Like, we like him. For sure. We vote with our pocket. Oh, yeah. There's the king. He's Messiah. And Jesus responds, listen. Don't, you, you're going to have to listen right now in the spirit. Jesus responds to this false coronation by retreating to be alone with the Father. And there's always a counterfeit coronation that short circuits Calvary. It's a shortcut. Because remember, he didn't just come to die. It's who he is. Does this make any sense? So he trades Israel's crown because he's not going to wear Saul's crown. He doesn't need Saul's crown. And he trades heaven's diadem for a crown of thorns. And he knows if he takes that route, he becomes king of a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And the devil's still offering kingdoms today. Still wanting to trade with you. In the name of Jesus. And, and this hour, listen carefully, you, you have to make covenants within covenants with God. You have to tighten the garden gates. The beloved says of the Shulamite, a garden enclosed is my sister. She's shut in. She's not just in the right country, not just in the right city, she's not just in the right property, she's not just at... Uh, and then the right acreage she's hemmed in a garden she's not just in the garden she let me put the gate around her and I've locked it and I'm going to protect that gate and nobody comes in but me that's called union with the Lord and these covenants within covenants keep, listen carefully protect you from the bartering nature of Satan himself who is the one who says worship me and I'll give you the kingdoms of the world 
That's what he does. He offers good deals that are not God deals. And so some of these covenants, within covenants in your life, I have news for you, will be misinterpreted as legalism, religion, obsession, fanaticism. No, no, they're love. They're love. And so we make up, we, we came up with these covenants here that we felt the Lord said to us, and I can't project them on everybody, but I can tell you, he was right. We have never promoted a speaker in this church. Never once. Not because that's sinful or wrong, but I've dreamt in my prayer closet of a people who would enter his house for him. And how can I blow up every bridge and every idol? How can I get the people to come and adore him, whether it's a famous guy preaching or a Jesus school student? It's not the point. It's that he is present among us. Those are covenants within covenants. We've never told you a worship leader's coming. Have we? Have we ever told you? What has that birthed in your family? It means you wake up Sunday morning going, I'm not here for a man. I'm, I'm, I'm breaking the, 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 I am crossing those doorsteps. I am crossing that threshold in the name of Jesus, not in the name of my favorite worship leader. That's a game changer. And, and let me tell you how it changes the game. Is that without you knowing over the last year and a half, you have gathered in his name yes. because of covenants within covenants. Costly? Yeah, of course. Slower growth? I guess, but who cares? Is this making sense? You take this out of the Christian life when the Christian life becomes about us. And I guess achievement. Only to give him stuff on that day that never asked for. That he didn't do. I heard a teacher say the other day, a Bible teacher, he said, yeah, some say the Gospel of Thomas should have made the canon of Scripture because it's the most historically accurate. I don't know if you noticed, every Easter there's a new historical Jesus at every register, at every grocery store, or Barnes & Noble, there's this new Jesus, right, who fell in love with Mary Magdalene, or that was one year, and then it was something else. But the fathers of the church said, no, the Gospel of Thomas doesn't make it. And here's why. I see no mention of the crucified and risen one. I'm really not interested in what he did when he was seven. Because the one we know is the one who comes to die and offer his body and births forth from the ground. And by death, he conquers death and offers us new life. That's the one we know. Talk to me about another Jesus. We're not interested, and I don't know him. Neither do I want him. You've heard me say this a million times. But at this point, when you get this, the whole Bible makes perfect sense. There's such wisdom in it. You, you see Jesus in the life of David. You see Jesus in the life of Joseph who has a coat of many colors, highly favored by his father, betrayed by his brethren, thrown into a pit or the underworld, right? Is raised up again and sits at the right hand of the, of the Pharaoh and gets us a ring. It's all Jesus. Yeah. The tabernacle is about Jesus, not lifestyle in the desert. It's all about Jesus. The temple is about Jesus. The Holy Spirit's coming. You take Jesus out of your relationship with the Holy Spirit, you're going to get weird in a day. Yeah. Noah's Ark, made of wood. Made of wood. Window on the side. From the side came a dove. 
looking for a resting place, floating on the waters of judgment or the waters of baptism that destroy the old life. Come out of the, the ark and build an altar and make a new covenant with God. And God blesses the earth. That's called the Christian life. The whole thing's about the Lord. Isn't he wonderful? Help me, Joel. The Christian life is an all-in life. All in. It's a, a life of the cross. Uh, for too long we've said altars save people. They don't save. This is just wood. This is, our, this is just pipe and drape. Or drape. These are just speakers. This is black carpet. Altar calls do not save. Only Jesus saves. Prayers don't save. No. When on that Christmas night, a prayer card did not land in the manger. One came who was fully God and fully man. And he came to die. Died to what? Everything but the will of his father. And this is the Christian life, to die. To die daily. To die to our own plans, our own bondage, our own thrills, whatever it might be. Anything that is ours, the Christian life, is to hand over the heart to the Father and trust him. And to follow the patterned son, Jesus, who carries a cross. And when that death sets in, resurrection is promised. Preachers shouldn't merely encourage you. Preachers are called to raise the dead. And this is the gospel. That he who is dead comes alive. If you never heard the gospel like this, I would, I would challenge as to whether or not you've ever heard it. If you didn't hear about the cross, you did not hear the gospel. Behold the Lamb who takes away the sins of the world. With every head bowed and eye closed this morning. Even while I'm talking, this might be a first time surrender, it might be a second, it might be a 100. If you're holding on to your life, I want you to stand up right now. You know it in your heart. And you feel that can, actually, let's have everyone stand. You feel the Lord pulling on you. I want you to come down here and meet you. This might be the first time. I don't know. This might be the hundredth time. This, it, you may have fallen out of love with Jesus. I want you to come forward. And I just want you to offer your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is, this is, this is the gospel. You come forward and just say, Jesus, I'm all yours. There might be pastors here. I don't know. I've seen many pastors get born again. I've seen many pastors who don't even know the one that they think they're talking about. Come to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I want our whole prayer team just begin praying in the Spirit. Don't move. Just pray in the Spirit. And you just, yeah, thank you, Lord. Just come and offer your life as a living sacrifice. When you behold the Lord this way, when you see Him rightly, when you, when you think of all He's done, as Paul writes in the book of Romans, it's just our normal worthy service to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I'd like our prayer team to come up, and we're going to start praying. And as we do, if you wish you came, you just come. You won't, you won't, you won't interrupt us. Can you in your seats just, just stretch your hands towards these precious souls? And just begin praying out loud in the Spirit. Yeah, thank you, Lord. There's more coming. Thank you, Father. Yeah. Don't resist. Just come to the Lord. Come to the Lord. There's no one so wonderful. 
Jesus said, if you keep your life, you'll lose it. If the heart holds on to its own will, you lose life. But when you let go, when you lose your life, you gain true life, which is him. Thank you, Father. I want us to pray this out loud. Yeah, come on down. Come on down. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, come on down. I want us to pray this out loud with clarity. Thank you, Father. Say this. Say, Father, I come to you this morning confessing my sin. You said, if I confess my sin, you are faithful and just to forgive my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Forgive me, Lord. Wash me in the precious blood of Jesus. Cleanse my soul. Cleanse my conscience. Jesus, I declare that you are the Son of the living God, that you came to the earth born of a virgin and lived a perfect and holy life and I declare that you died on the cross and shed your blood for me and for the sins of the world Jesus you were buried and raised and you're alive today you are God Almighty I confess you to be the Son of God. And you've ascended to the right hand of the Father. You are enthroned forever. And you are coming back again to judge the living and the dead. I hand my life over to you because you are worthy of my life. Receive my life precious Jesus. Today, I deny myself. I take up the cross and follow you the best I know how. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Lord. I now want everyone to stretch their hands towards these people. And I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit comes upon them. Just close your eyes if you've come forward. And just receive, receive the wonderful presence of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, pray out loud, church. If I could have a little more in the crowd, Chris, in my ear. Jesus, you are the great baptizer in the Holy Spirit and fire. Come upon them, I pray in Jesus' name. Wonderful Holy Spirit, and fill them to the uttermost. Fill them this morning. No more struggle. Oh, I feel this strong. If you're, dealing with, if you're dealing with cycles of sin, you get down here right now. If there's stuff in your life you cannot beat, the Holy Spirit is the answer, not your ability. Get to, don't, don't wait. There's no shame. Get down here. Get down here right now. Just come down here and get, just get down here on your knees if you're able. Pray, church, pray. Pray, church, pray. I had an experience that I saw, I saw, I can, all, all I can say is this, that the devil lies to people and they don't get free. But through prayer, I saw that these people would be freed in this church. And, and it's not in our works. It's not by might. It's not by power. It's by the Spirit. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, come upon these people, I pray in Jesus' name. The precious fire of the Holy Spirit, burn out the dross, set them free, quicken them, live through them. Father, I pray the same for the entire church today. For the entire church, receive, receive just a fresh, a fresh infilling. Paul said, be ye filled. Be not drunk with wine, but be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. Receive the blessed touch of the Spirit. 
that wonderful fragrance of the Lord, the easy touch of the Spirit, the ease of the Christian life, of surrender, yieldedness, the beauty of trusting the Lord. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In the name of Jesus, every cycle breaks. Every pattern breaks. Turn your eyes from your sin now and look to the Lord. Just look to Jesus. Just look to Jesus. Look, to, look and live, the scripture says. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Praise you. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Is there a, a missionary here or you feel incredibly called to missions? and you've been so confused about your assignment, like it's been a very confusing decision. If that's you, would you lift your hand? Like it's, it's been like almost torturous you've been so confused. Right here. Come down here, will you? Thank you, Lord. Yeah, just get down on your knees there, and team, I want you to get your hands on them. Yeah. Before they start praying, I just want you to look at me. Jesus was preaching, and they said, how can we do the will of the Father? And Jesus said this, the will of the Father is to cling to the Son. And the Lord's going to bring a great simplicity this morning. Leave the assignment to him. Leave the experience to him. Leave the details to him. Cling to the Son. Would you guys get your hands on them? Lord, let the simplicity of Jesus flood their soul. Flood their soul. You'll cling to the Son, and trust me, the Son will walk, and he'll move. You just follow him wherever he goes. That's all. We follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Isn't he wonderful? Thank you, Lord. Can we just give him our love this morning? Come on, just let him know you love him. Lord, we love you. We love you. We love you. I think we're going to receive communion tonight, okay? Oh, come on, let's give him a shout. I just feel the blessing of him here. Thank you, Jesus. Now, for, for those of you who've come forward, for those of you who've come forward, would you look me in the eye? For those of you who've come forward, just look me in the eye for a moment. Unless you're unable. I know some of you are being touched by the Lord. This should be your last day of victories and defeats over and over and over you don't have to stay there. Every day, read your Bible. Every day, this is living food, living bread. Jesus said, man doesn't live by bread alone. Therefore, the scriptures are a matter of life and death. Okay? Number two, pray every day. If you say you don't know how, this is one thing the Holy Spirit will teach you. He's happy to do it. You say, where do I start? Jesus said, go into your room and close the door. Pray to your Father who's in secret. And tell him, I don't know what I'm doing. And take your Bible in there. And just, you can pray the word. And questions will arise. And you take those questions to the Lord. And without knowing, prayer's birth. Okay? Three, get baptized in water. I know many of you have. Um, this would be for your first time. People, the first timers giving their heart to Jesus. Get baptized in water. That is a true experience with God. It's much more than an outward symbolism. Nothing in the new covenant is symbolism. That's religion. But in the new covenant, 
when we obey the Lord, the Spirit is promised in baptism. So get baptized, and we can help you do that, okay? Number four. Is that three or four? That's, that's whatever. They're all good. Number four, you need to be part of a community of people. And for those of you who aren't here in town, uh, find a church that loves the presence of God and the whole Bible. Okay? Even if it meets <laughs> in a warehouse. Find a church that loves the presence of God and loves the scriptures. All of them. Okay? Lastly, we already prayed that God would fill you with the Spirit and empower you. And that is a daily request that you should ask for. So that's the lifestyle of the Christian. Lord, fill me again as I adore you. Amen? Church, can we give the Lord praise for what he's done? This is beautiful. Thank you, I'm going to have uh, Amy, would you come? Before you leave, I'm going to have Amy just pray a blessing over you. We will see you tonight. Tonight will be a very holy and special night. I would get there early. I wouldn't miss it tonight. Just lift your hands. Receive this blessing. Go ahead, Amy. Father, we just thank you so much. We thank you for your presence here this morning, Lord. And we thank you that we know nothing but Christ and him crucified. Lord, let what Pastor Michael prayed and what he spoke get deep within our hearts that we see you in every scripture, Lord, that when we open up the word of God, Lord, that you be radiant, Lord, that we see you, Jesus, Christ and him crucified. That is our life, Jesus. Lord, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for this day, Lord. We love you, Jesus. Yeah. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Love you so much. Amen. See you tonight. God bless you. This Jesus born of a virgin, manifested the Father perfectly. He is the Father's only sermon. The Father has one sermon, it is, this is my son. The first Adam eats from a living tree and death comes. 4,000 years later, Jesus comes, hangs as the first fruit on a dead tree, and life comes. And this is why, had they known, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. Scripture says, cursed be any man who hangs on a tree. But Jesus took your curse upon the cursed tree. Therefore, cursing your curse and canceling it forever. Adam falls in a garden, Jesus wins in a garden. Hey everyone, Michael and Jess here. We are standing in the exact location where the headquarters for Jesus Image will be. Local church, Jesus School, a House of Bethany, all of that will be located right here. In fact, in the exact spot where Jesse and I are standing will be the beautiful pond in front of the sanctuary where we will most likely be holding baptism services occasionally. So we're so excited. We're right here in Seminole County off of Lake Mary Boulevard. We own this land. God owns this land, I should say. And the building will be right behind us. The sanctuary, the admin building, and the prayer house. And so listen, we just want to say thank you so much. Thank you for standing with us. Thank you for giving. Thank you for praying. Thank you for being so patient and believing with us. We're believing God that the nations will descend on this property, that they will worship Jesus, that the sick will be healed here, that the lost will be saved, that the presence and glory of God will rest here. We want that. We believe this is holy ground and that the tangible glory of Jesus will be right here on this land. And so we want to invite you to come and invite you to be a part of what God is going to do here. Yeah, we are just so very thankful for you. Thank you so much for your prayers and your love and support. We are truly blown away with what the Lord is doing and we cannot wait to have you here with us one day. Yeah, and we're really excited about what we're gonna show you right now. We wanna take you on a journey and show you the incredible design, 
detail and vision of what will take place on this property. Our Jesus Image home will be located in the beautiful Seminole County, right off of Lake Mary Boulevard. This is a thriving area filled with families, restaurants, and the beautiful amenities that this area provides. The vision of this property is simple. We want the presence of Jesus Christ to be known. We have a deep value for experiencing the Lord in His beauty and the majesty of His creation. This facility will host our local church family, Jesus School, which is our discipleship training program, yearly conferences, the Bethany House of Prayer, and it will also be an outreach hub for the state and nation. There is vision behind everything. The location of the buildings, the landscaping, the water features, and of course the architectural design of the buildings themselves all speak to the beauty of the Lord. We want all who enter the property to feel as though they've entered into the peace of the presence of God. With all the stress and turmoil that people face on a daily basis, this will be a place of serenity, worship, reflection, and adoration. Rather than this feeling like a headquarters, we want this to be the house of God and a home for His people. You will notice that the structures themselves have a timeless look and design. From the stonework to the stained glass, it will feel like the house of God. The gospel will be declared from every side of the property in multiple different ways. As you pull into the new Jesus Image home, you will discover a massive parking area that will be framed by and filled with beautiful shrubbery and trees. There will be plenty of room for you and your family. A beautiful drive leads you to the sanctuary building. You will enter through a stone archway. Upon the archway, one of the foundational verses for Jesus Image will be inscribed. This verse carries the heartbeat of our lives and the construction of this house. Only one thing is needed, Luke 10, 42. Upon entering the front door to the main building, you will see a massive gathering area. It is a two-story structure. The first level will be filled with life. This will be a place to congregate with friends and family, to get your children checked into children's church, to eat, or simply enjoy a coffee around a beautiful fireplace. The first level will also house the youth room. We have a major focus on seeing this next generation love Jesus. The youth room will seat approximately 500 people. This room will also serve as the second year facility for Jesus School. Our children's rooms will be located on the first level. This will be a convenient experience for children and parents upon their arrival. Our children will receive amazing Bible teaching, a worship experience, and knowledge of the presence of the Holy Spirit for themselves. The second level of the main building will facilitate working spaces for our board of directors, our staff, and interns. This will be a great blessing for us as we move forward in wisdom as a ministry. As you know, God has graced Jesus' image with a massive reach through media. Thousands have come to Jesus, and so many have been healed and set free through our media ministry. We will have our very own production studio where we can create content and continue to stream live to the nations. We will release podcasts, social media content, videos, and much more. Multiplied millions have watched our media content, and we believe our creative team will flourish in this new space as they step out into this vital and anointed calling. As you walk across the main gathering space, you will discover the sanctuary. What an amazing space this will be. While we will have state-of-the-art technology in the sanctuary, the space will take you back in time, a time when churches had a sacred feel to them. You will discover beautiful stained glass behind the platform. Stained glass will line the sides of the sanctuary as well, all telling the gospel story of Jesus. There will be timeless wood beaming and stonework throughout. We long for his presence to fill this place, and it will be a home for you as well. We will seat approximately 1,500 people, yet it will not lose the personal feel that we so deeply value. The platform will be spacious with plenty of room for ministry, our worship teams, and of course, a baptismal. 
you will notice a round stained glass image on the back wall of the sanctuary depicting a dove in fire descending in the room. May the Holy Spirit fill our hearts each time we gather as a church family. The sanctuary space will also serve Jesus School. This will house our hundreds of first year students as well as our general school sessions. These students will be missionaries to the nations of the world and to their generation. The gospel will be declared from this sanctuary space multiple times per week and people will be raised up from this place to share Jesus with the world. May millions be saved, healed, and touched by the Holy Spirit. Lastly, for our favorite space on the property, the Bethany House of Prayer. This will be the prayer house for Jesus' image. It will be a place for adoration, silent prayer, reflecting upon the scriptures, and worship. You will notice that the house will be built upon a pond. The setting will be quaint and breathtaking. Stone and wood mark the space with warmth and a traditional look that we believe will transcend generations. We believe this will be the hub of the entire property a place where intimacy with God and pure prayer ascend before Him. It is named Bethany House because Bethany was the place where Jesus was loved deeply. Therefore, He rested there. Mary found the better part, and it is our prayer that all who enter will find Jesus there and fall in love with Him. May Jesus be pleased with all that takes place here. May He be adored and worshiped on this property. May his word be taught with clarity, boldness, and love. May his gospel flood the nations, and may the generations to come find him here. Will you stand with us? Will you pray and give toward this vision? Will you give sacrificially for the sake of Jesus and his gospel? Will you be a part of something that will outlive you for the sake of eternity? Thank you. We love you. Jesus is beautiful.